Welcome to the Parasite Podcast, a show about me and you. We are Venom. Hey, what's up, Parasites, and welcome back to another episode of the Parasite Podcast. And I have an amazing guest here who was really patient with me. I've been having some switching with alters a lot rapidly this week, just having a bad week. And Jonah here, who's an amazing artist, was kind enough to reschedule this with me. So Jonah, first, thanks for that. And Jonah, I want to I want to hear uh, from your words a little bit about yourself and where people can find you. Sure. Um, well, as some people might infer from the decorations behind me, um, I was a video game artist for a number of years. I worked on games like Skyrim and Fallout 3 and 4, uh, as well as the Oblivion, Oblivion, the Shivering Isles. And then I left Bethesda Softworks. I went freelance for the last 10 years. I've been doing a lot more um, streaming, um, independent projects, contracts. Um, and then I kind of moved from 3D art to 2D concept art and illustration. And so um, most recently, I'm known for my work on Marvel Anatomy, which came out in October. Um, that was through Insight Editions. And essentially, that is a 230-page compendium of biological and physiological information on uh, about 60-plus heroes and villains from the Marvel Universe. And that was a really, really uh, fantastic um, gig. Uh, and yeah, and so... And so uh, uh, that's that's where we are today. And then and then these days I'm working on my own uh, projects, which we'll talk about in in a, in a bit. Absolutely. And I do want to dive more into Marvel Anatomy because that book is brilliant. It's so neat and it approaches characters from a way that I struggle with. And so, so yeah, and there's the book there. And you guys, I'm going to put links down below to Amazon if you want to buy it there. If you'd like an autographed copy, I'm going to put a link to Jonah's store. Um, and that's going to be down below as well in the description box. And if there's a collector's edition version of this out there for $200, it's amazing. It's a, a hardcover, obviously, but it comes with exclusive prints, limited ones, including Venom, uh, which, you know, any Venom fan needs to have in their collection. So we're going to get into all that for sure. And yeah, I want to talk about your projects as well. So to begin with, um, I want to start there. Like you talked about Skyrim, you talked about Fallout. I love those games. They're brilliant. Like as uh, from a design standpoint, um, people who watch my show know, but Jonah, you don't know. Uh, I used to draw all the time. A brain aneurysm rupture uh, 13 years ago wow. affected my visual memory and, and a bunch of other things. So drawing is a massive struggle for me nowadays. Wow. And and so I, I've lost kind of the ability to approach characters from a visual standpoint, which is why I'm so enamored by work from you and other artists out there so uh doing video games going from that to a 2d like you said what was that transition like and i'm um, imagining you still do 3d design because i also heard you say you're a movie monster fan and i imagine you do stuff like that as well yeah um it's been quite a journey um you know before i worked in 3d in video games uh i was a student uh, i was a youngin i did a lot of drawing then but then in the seven years i was at bethesda I really let those skills languish, you know, um, and I kind of just focused on my 3D art for when I was there. And then when I left, I just I just kind of realized that um, 3D didn't have quite the same allure that it used to. Um, I think there's things that you can do in 2D art that you really can't do in 3D art. And a lot of that comes down to um, context, um, uh, um, composition, and narrative. Um, narrative kind of being the big one. Um, even if it's not a panel by panel comic book, you can do a lot in a single illustration to provide context and story and mood and all that. Whereas in 3D, you're kind of creating these isolated 3D art assets, which in the case of my giants or my dragons um, or my, my Draugr, Deathclaws, et cetera, can be really fun and gratifying and full of detail. But um, you are, as a 3D artist, you are um, by definition, part of an assembly line process in a larger game which can be great working in a uh, on a project that is bigger than yourself uh, with a host of other talented, like-minded individuals. Not to knock that at all, but I think I, I was just looking for a way to transition into a, a different realm where I kind of knew less and thus had more room to grow and I could assert more creative control over the entire process. And so that's kind of been something I've been focusing on a lot. It was bruising at first um, and when I say at first, I mean constantly and to this day, um, but I find it much more um, rewarding. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've all been there, whether whatever your line of work, you get to that point where, okay, in this job, I'm just a kind of a cog in a machine and that's okay because I know my place and, and I'm going to 
mm-hmm. attribute what I'm here for. But then, yeah, you get that itch where you're like, I can do more. I can be more. I can challenge myself more. And, uh, and we all hit that. And that's amazing to hear. I mean, like, uh, you know, I, and I've worked in both too. I've been a machine part. I've been, the, you know, the, at the top, I've been in the middle, like I've been everywhere. Um, and, and I think, uh, having that journey. And like you said, the bruises still keep coming. Like you, as an artist and a storyteller and a creative person, you, you never stop learning. I think Bruce Lee always said, always be a student. And, yeah. uh, and that's always the best mentality to have is that it keeps you humble, but it keeps you willing to grow. Um, Absolutely. and, and I, I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I'm not new to your art, but new to your name tied to your art. Yeah. And, you know, and I think a lot of people might be where they're like, oh, I know the games. I know this, I know the designs. Oh, okay. This is the guy who's done those. And I like seeing you kind of stepping into the spotlight and I want to dive in, you know, transition that into the Marvel anatomy book, because that book, like you said, it's 60 plus characters of Marvel. You're going into insane details on, and you're kind of rethinking the characters uh, completely on some of them, uh, stuff I never would have thought of, like the physiology of Mystique. What does it take for Mystique to shape shift and change? I mean, look at that, uh, this artwork of, of with Iron Man there. Um, this stuff's amazing. And what's cool about this book is there's a narrative to it because it's kind of like scrolls have invaded and T'Challa is trying to use science to figure out what's going on. And through the, the you know, the pen of um, Mark Sumerek and uh, Daniel Wallace, and then your amazing artwork and illustrations, you get this cool experience in that book. Like, how did that come together? And what is one of your biggest takeaways from working on that project? Um, yeah, good question. Um, it kind of came to me, um, I think because of my work on Fallout and Skyrim, um, the editor, Inside, Inside Editions, who'd kind of, this had been his dream project to put together for a long time, uh, had been following me for a while. And I think because my specialty is has traditionally been in characters and creature design. I'm much more familiar than your average artist with anatomy uh, and with how that works. And so, um, yeah, and you know, I'd always obviously really enjoyed superheroes and that kind of thing, but I never thought that there was a lot of room for me creatively within the realm of um, comic books, simply because the writers had most of the creative control and there's a certain canon that you have to follow and respect, um, right? Um, that's kind of, these are, this is how it works. And there's not a lot of room for individual artists to kind of jump forward with revolutionary um, um, moves because, you know, a lot of the things have been kind of figured out. Right. But uh, when I was approached with this project, I, I was struck immediately by how completely open-ended it was um, hmm. and how no one had done this before. There is no book like Marvel Anatomy, uh, except for DC Anatomy, which was right. done by a different artist a couple, <laughs> couple of years ago. Sure. Same, same, same publisher. And I think, um, and that's the reason that this exists, um, is that that first book did well and they wanted to do something bigger, better, more comprehensive for the Marvel Universe. And so um, I realized that this was a realm in which I could exert creative control uh, in a way that otherwise I would not be allowed to. And so I really wanted to kind of take ownership of a lot of things that had uh, heretofore, I don't know if that's <laughs> there to here or whatever, I don't know what it is, yeah. um, uh, never kind of been claimed. There's, there's all this kind of, you know, oh, you know what, what do Iron, Man, Iron Man's nanites in his uh, um, um, extremist armor look like? Right. No one's ever drawn them before. Um, right. No one's ever um, drawn, you know, any of the uh, uh, crystals from the uh, gems from the Infinity Gauntlet up close, like really, really up close. Um, what does a scroll look like under its skin? You know, uh, how do the molecules in uh, um, Mr. Fantastic's suit bend according to his skin? You know, um, what does the thing look like under his plates? None right. of these things had ever been covered before. Right. Um, and so I just realized that while uh, Mark Sumerak and, and Daniel Wallace, I never met Daniel Wallace, by the way. Mark oh. Sumerak and I were very intimately involved in this project. But um, yeah, uh, so there was a text to guide me, okay. but when it came to the visuals, it was completely open-ended. And um, so yeah, what we did is we uh, took the manuscript uh, written by the, the two writers. Um, and again, which takes the perspective of Black Panther. And then I illustrated it as I saw fit, basically. I had very little oversight, uh, which was wonderful. Marvel was, <laughs> surprisingly and almost shockingly accommodating uh, with my ideas. Okay. Um, I think they 
they, they had very few edits uh, throughout the whole process uh, other than, you know, Vision's arm is too long here or something. Okay, yeah. Occasionally they wanted to have certain outfits featured over others because, you know, there's many different iterations of different heroes. And uh, so I generally tried to go with the classic uh, depiction. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think because this book was spearheaded by Inside Editions and not Marvel, mm -hmm. I think I had the advantage of Marvel actually didn't know what this product was going to look like. And so I got to be the one to define it for them. Cool. And I think as long as the art was like cool and didn't fly in the face of that, which had been established before they were down. So yeah, it, 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 it went pretty well, uh, over overall. And that's awesome. Yeah. I was, you know, I always wonder about the process of those books because, um, like I've been following Venom, like the movies, uh, for the last six years. And, uh, I have a visual guide essentially of the entire process from the day one of production of the first movie to now we're about to enter uh, day one of the third movie going into yeah. filming. So it's, it's, I love like coffee table books. I love mm -hmm. collaborations like this artwork. And I, but I always wonder, I'm like, who came up with this? Was it the editor? Was it, you know, did Marvel do it? And it's so cool to hear that side of it, at least for me, like I, I'm like completely enamored and to hear that kind of freedom you got and the stuff you can define. And I do want to dive into that before, but before we get into that, cause that's going to segue us into the last half of this discussion with Venom sure. specifically, um, before we dive into that and speaking of your own creations, I do want to talk a little bit about your Patreon, at least mention it because and it does tie into Marvel Anatomy because you've been making these Marvel Anatomy videos yeah. based on some of the characters from the book. And they're amazing. The, the videos are really well cut. You guys do a really good job on, on, on producing these. Uh, definitely, I was taking notes like, oh, I, I, I think I know how to do that. And that's that's actually a really good idea. It's very clever. And um, and I, I really like the package you guys put together with those. But you mentioned in your last one that when you did Venom, which, uh, you know, broke my heart and got me excited that I at least got a Venom episode, but you were like, yeah, these are, these are tough. And as an independent creator, time and money and everything factors into everything you do. Yeah. So you mentioned your Patreon. So I would tell people out there, please go and check out his Patreon. And if it's something you're into, please, you know, subscribe, join it, follow him. It's just three bucks for the, the Glowstones um, tier, but there's also a $7 tier where you get more access to some of his artwork. It's amazing. And, and what you'll be supporting is that money will be going towards future you know, Marvel videos and other videos that you want to make. So real quick, I want to give you a chance to kind of plug that uh, and then and mention Quiet, which is a book you're putting together and showing off on Patreon, which I already have fallen in love with. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, um, I um, wanted to, my, my YouTube channel, um, the content changes, you know, I have a uh, a, a big Skyrim documentary out there that's about an hour long um, where I interview nine other developers. Uh, that was a lot of fun to put together. But, uh, and then my, my subject matter changes, you know, uh, or has changed kind of over the years. Um, but the the thrust of it, of, of it all is mostly the same, which is art education and world building education. So uh, even for those who are not, people who are non-artists, how do you build worlds? How do you create you know, uh, stories and narratives and uh, lore of your own or um, um, or suggest it within your work. And so I wanted to do that with Marvel Anatomy. I think a lot of people see the finished product of a thing and they really don't understand how the how I got there. You know, um, how do the artist get gets there? And I and so the, the thrust and the purpose of my YouTube channel is to demystify the creative process. And so with these Marvel videos, yeah, I really, really have been loving doing them. Um, they really have been taking off in the last couple of months, which has been great. Um, I did do a shout out for um, Patreon subscribers. And it, it, yeah, it's a little frustrating trying to get support because this, you know, my most recent video, the, the um, uh, Venom video is passing 200,000 views yeah. as we speak. And people are loving it and people are leaving comments and all that stuff. But as I'm sure you're aware, you know, uh, getting getting people to actually put down three dollars, you know, to to help uh, continue it, it, it is it is hard to do. I would say I got maximum a dozen people mm -hmm. to join, um, and so yeah, uh, if if you're out there and you you're enjoying my content, please um, put down a, a couple dollars and help me out because I am a freelance artist. I don't make that much money. Um, and I really, really want to keep this series up and I can tell from the views that it's getting. I mean, my, my, my Wolverine, uh, video has gotten 
600,000 views. Yeah. My storm video has gotten over 200,000 views or, or 100,000 100, views. Yeah. Spider-Man's heading towards 200. I want to keep doing it. I want to do one on the scrolls. Uh, I think if I get my chance to do, if I get a chance to do one more, I will do Groot and I will actually break down how I did Groot also for the collector's edition of Marvel Anatomy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, thank you for the shouting that out. Um, and then yeah, Quiet is my venture into the world of comic books myself. Um, it's not a hero um, story. It's a very unusual kind of, um, it's, it's simultaneously very unusual and extremely familiar feeling. Um, Quiet is a lovely little character who I dreamed up, uh, dreamt up a couple of years ago and has just been kind of haunting my dreams. And so it's a David and Goliath story. It's a black and white uh, comic book in the vein of uh, Skyrim meets Calvin and Hobbes um, kind of thing. And it's, it's funny, it's scary, it's whimsical, um, and it's full of adventure. So um, if you are curious to know more, you can find me on Instagram, you can find me on Patreon, um, and I will be releasing videos about the making of this comic book in the next couple, in the next two months. Awesome. Yeah. I, well, black and white is one of my favorite things ever. I'm a big fan. Uh, James Obar's the crow was le left a major impression on me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and also that got me into like watercolors at one point. And then Tim sales artwork too. rest in peace. Like a, a lot of his stuff. I actually have a painting from the set of heroes uh, uh, because I'm such a big Tim Sale fan, so it's from the actual set, and it's the uh, it's the main image, it's the eclipse, um, and I, I stare at it every day, and uh, and I'm like, yeah, I just I've been inspired by a lot of people, and hearing you talk about this stuff, I, I mean, it's like it makes me wish I could just go and draw again. Like I, I'm just like, it's so interesting to watch you work and um, and to see the stuff you come up with, and like you said, like my channel is that's what I loved. You said that in one of your videos. You said, you know, I just want to kind of demystify some things. And that's been my whole YouTube experience. I've worked in movies. I was an editor in comic books. Um, I've done all those things. And I'm like, well, Venom is part of all of that. And so I can actually peel back some layers and explain why certain decisions get made, why certain things happen, why certain books come out at certain times. And, and I've been able to demystify too, but I'm the same way I've started. I did a Patreon before and I've tried to do memberships and you know, even with nearing 3000 subs, I get like two people, which is amazing. It's like, it's like, Hey, that's okay. I don't mind putting out free stuff. Cause my videos are, they're easy to make. They're not like yours, yours. When I was watching yours, I'm like, yeah, there's some of these, I just can't. And I won't, I don't know that much about, you know, this tech to make it look that good or whatever. And, and so to me, I'm like, but I, I share your passion for wanting to just hopefully demystify something. So people don't think it's impossible. I think that's a lot of times people go like, oh, I, I'd always wanted to do that. And I, when people come to my channel, I listen to that. And, and we actually, for our 800th episode of Venom Vlog, which is going to be posting any day now. Um, hey, happy anniversary. Hey, thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, and what I wanted to do was I call all of the viewers the parasites because uh, it's a term of endearment from the Venom movie. And, uh, and what I did was I asked all of them, I said, write your own, create your own Venom. I go, most of us will never work for Marvel. So let's do an 800 episode celebrating all of us. And I had like a dozen people write in and say, here's my idea for Venom. So I read them all out and, and with some artwork. So you're going to see that coming up. Um, so I, I so that's what I'm saying is like, I love your kind of your viewpoint, your mission statement, and, and I love your work. So diving back into Marvel Anatomy, um, in this book, you were talking about approaching characters in ways that, you know, most don't, because like you said, there's some artists out there in comics that learned anatomy. Um, and then, but they, they, there's not a lot of them. Um, they, they just learn a style and they stick to that style and they right. refine it over the years, but right. to actually start from a scientific advantage and work your way up, you brought up stuff with venom on your venom page. And I'm going to focus on that because I want everyone else to go buy the book and see all the other characters. And I want you to go watch his video about all the other venom stuff he talks about. I just want to zero in on the venom eyes because you mentioned that the way they transmit information into Eddie's human eyes. And then you brought up something I never, ever considered, which is the tongue being a different color, possibly be can't, being the reason is that it's a, it, it has a different function and mm -hmm. it could be providing oxygen to the host. Mm -hmm. So I really love that. Where, what kind of, um, how, how did you like zero in on those two things and, and kind of peel back those layers from them? 
Yeah, I think you know you look at Venom and he's covered head head to toe, right? In yeah. in in his, the black symbiote, with very little few embellishments. There's the spider. There's the white patches on the back of the gloves, which is just such a cool um, uh, uh, design. But otherwise, it's it's an impermeable and very um, uniform layer. And then you have this giant mouth with this lolling tongue and these long um, curling eyes. It's incredibly iconic um, yeah. look. And it's incredibly cool. And um, so then you, but then you have to wonder, you know, like why, why, you know, beyond just it being cool, why is it doing that? Um, and so it's my job to kind of analyze the designs made by Marvel and try to almost reverse engineer what's going on. And, um, you know, with, you know, uh, a lot of people are commented in my Venom video that they always thought that Venom uh, or that Eddie rather shape shifted under, underneath Venom um, to kind of accommodate. And I think, Hmm. Um, I think certain symbiotes definitely do. Like, for instance, like Carnage, I think they are bonded on a deeper level, on a much more disturbing and visceral body <laughs> horror level. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to make a stand myself either way, but Marvel made a stand in the book. They said, no, this is like an exosuit that works over here, uh, works over Eddie. Um, so I wanted to make sure that the features had some meaning. So for instance, he's got these long curling eyes and they're kind of, the eyes are, they're flat. They're not like normal ocular, you know, uh, sensory organs um, of most animals. Now, I believe that symbiotes can, to some extent, see with their entire body, uh, much like an octopus um, has light sensors, that kind of thing. And I think, I believe that they can breathe through their entire body. Um, they don't need specialized organs, but when they have a host, um, they have to, you know, the human, I'm sure they can, they can, to some extent, just feed oxygen through the skin or whatever. But at a certain point, a human just needs to <sighs> oxygen and they need to be able to kind of see and to breathe and everything. So, I, you know, I really came down to the question of how does a symbiote augment the abilities of their wearer? And so with the eyes, I felt like, well, we always, you know, the way that the eyes work in tandem with the brain is we're actually seeing everything upside down all the time, but our brains reverse it, you know, um, without us even thinking about it. And so I thought that you have these long curling eyes. Um, and I thought that that brings in, that must bring in so much light from all around. And so I imagine that feeding in through that exterior, um, through the material kind of down into the eye, eyes themselves. Now, I believe that a lot of what Eddie Brock can see, uh, he does so uh, psychically, you know, mm -hmm. like he, he, so I don't, I don't think he just relies on what his eyeballs are picking up. But I think, again, I think for the, for, um, for speed, for, for um, maximum compatibility, I think the eyes of Venom feed and pull in a lot of light, you know, literally bending the light through the many different layers of ocular cells mm -hmm. um, down into Eddie's eyes themselves. Um, the tongue, especially, I believe tastes like a, like a viper. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and this is important because, you know, for in, incredibly, for tracking abilities, for being able to smell, uh, smelling blood, scenting, uh, characters uh, nearby. Um, I believe that that tongue being a much more raw, fleshy bit, uh, of, of Venom's anatomy. Again, I believe Venom can smell anywhere on his skin, but, I believe also that he has he has to make that skin hard and rather impermeable because if somebody comes out of the shadows with a knife, right. you know, uh, it's got to be prepared to deflect, you know. And so I think the surface of the Clintar symbiote has to adapt constantly. And so I think these specialized areas, the pinker, raw, fleshier areas, the soft palate um, has these more raw sensory abilities. So sensing, tasting the air. Um, and then, like as you as you mentioned, uh, the big thing that I had kind of uh, posited that Marvel was like, yeah, that sounds cool. We're down. Um, is that that they can that he that Eddie can huff oxygen uh, at a much greater rate um, through the soft tissue of the tongue, and you know it was kind of my way of thinking of kind of playfully like, why is that tongue always flying all around all the time? You know, like it's yes, it's awesome to draw, but like why? And I thought, well, it's tasting, you know, just like a, like a, a, a viper is always moving around, but it's also just filled with, I think they're called papillae or whatever, little yeah. tiny little vessels that just allow him to breathe and to smell and, you know, very easily through that uh, soft tissue. Um, 
And I also thought that that soft tissue of the palate would ultimately kind of cover his face. Um, so, right. you know, his face is just in there, just behind the mouth right. at all times. Um, so, yeah, it was great fun trying to figure out how uh, a symbiote, you know, who normally doesn't have much of a face, um, right. you know, how it uh, uh, tailors the face, it's, it's, it's symbiote face to Eddie's and, and feeds and augments his abilities from there. It It's yeah. And it's awesome. You bring in that to the table. Cause even back in the beginning with McFarlane's first drawing of Venom, there was no tongue. And so the tongue was something that Eric Larson added later. Mm. And he, and it was because in his mind, he was like, he drew the tongue. And then someone was like, Whoa, where'd the tongue come from? He goes, he didn't have a tongue before. <laughs> and, and it, it like no, He's like, I just assumed his mouth opened so big. There was always a tongue coming out. And they're like, no, McFarlane never drew a tongue. And it's, it's kind of like Superman flying on the radio show and it becoming Canon, you know? And yes. it's uh, so it's so cool to see every new artist over each generation mm -hmm. um, every year, even even every month coming in and adding something or diving in. And what you did, I saw that you said one of your inspirations was Adam uh, Kubert. And yep. I, I love this. You mentioned this book and I was so, I was like, dude, this guy's like my best friend. Uh, <laughs> I, I love Ghost Rider in general, but this spirit of vengeance uh, slash spirits of venom crossover is so good. And there's so much great tongue, you know, action in it. There's a lot of musculature. That, that, that frame you just showed up, you just showed, yeah. uh, if you could show that again, that's one of yeah. my favorite. And talk about narrative design. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's got a great pose, great lighting, um, and All it tells teeth. you everything you need to know, you know, and, yeah. and it's, they you put the camera inside of Venom's mouth. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, it's like a horror movie. And even recently with episode 800, me and my friend um, PJ, who's, who's my artist, uh, he does a lot of stuff for IDW, like Ninja Turtles. And uh, he, um, we were coming up with our idea for Venom for episode 800. And we got rid of the eyes because we were like, well, the eyes come from Spider-Man, you know, when it bonded to Spider-Man. So in our, our version of Venom, he never bonded to Spider-Man. So we just have this white circle in the middle. But mm. e every phase he goes through, because we like horror movies and Resident Evil, the, the hole gets bigger and you see more of like the blob movie cover where someone's face is pressing through oh, cool. and, and more teeth are coming out and it just gets like more massive and more like resident evil looking. So, um, so yeah, I like, again, I just love hearing anyone talk about venom, but also their interpretation of what he does. And one thing though, I, I don't get seen a lot and this is, I don't even know how you would draw this, but I'm curious on your thoughts of it. Cause this is something I think about as someone with memory problems and, you know, I, I miss days at a time. As we saw yesterday, I missed my whole entire day almost. Um, so the symbiotes have this amazing ability where they can transfer memories and even unlock or compartmentalize the current host memories. And we've been learning that throughout the years with, with Eddie and stuff and, uh, and you know, how instantly the suit bonded to him and he instantly knew Peter Parker was Spider-Man because he had the memories that, you know, the suit took from being with Peter. So something like that, like, you know, I'm just kind of curious on your your point of view as an as an artist and creator of like what what that must be like for someone who's bonded to the suit. Like, can can you ever really trust the suit? Um, and mm. uh, you know, is or is that? Um, yeah, I'm just kind of curious. I don't know. I don't know how to answer or phrase this question, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm wondering if what's your <laughs> point of view on memory transfer and compartmentalizing and stuff with a symbiote must be like. Yeah, totally. Um, I think, you know, what I said in the video was basically, you know, the story of the symbiotes is a story of relationships and yeah. every symbiote host connection, it's a relationship. And I think, so when you say, can you trust them? Um, can you trust the people in your life? You can trust some people, you can't yeah. trust others, you know, and, and we also are, we, we tend to, you know, uh, it's hard to gauge sometimes the interactions between us. Um, whereas some people um, invariably, manipulate or obfuscate or whatever, you know, uh, in our everyday life for various reasons, whether, whether we purposefully want to deceive somebody or we are deceiving ourselves. <laughs> and so I think, you know, my, my suspicion, uh, because the bond between host and symbiote is psychic primarily in nature, uh, as well as, uh, with having physical, um, connections as well. Um, I think it would be, it would be, I imagine it would be very difficult for a symbiote to completely deceive um, uh, a host without the host being at least aware that, 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 that the symbiote was trying to keep something from them. Because mm -hmm. I think there is, you know, when you're forming a psychic bond, you're kind of laying your cards on the table um, right off the bat. Now, that isn't to say that either a host or a symbiote 
we try to get the better of the other individual because when you're entering into a relationship, some relationships are toxic. Um, right. And so you can certainly have a situation where either the symbiote is, is basically bullying the host or vice versa, right? right. Um, depends on, you know, and it's a constant battle of kind of, um, it doesn't have to be a battle, it's, but it's a constant negotiation of kind of who's on top. Um, when it comes to the memories, uh, memories, yeah, I suspect that that's something that either can be shared voluntarily, um, mm -hmm. but if you want to keep memories from your symbiote, I think that's a bit of a harder thing because you're, you know, the 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 nature of the bond itself necessitates a psychic connection, and uh, if you're psychically connected to somebody, you can still withhold information from them. But I think it's almost like that other person can almost see that there's a locked chest, you know, right. and that they, they're not being let in. Um, so yeah, I think it really comes down to the personalities involved, you know, personalities being something that you're very familiar with. Personalities are very powerful things. Um, and you know, even when I'm designing characters, uh, no matter what character is, you know, I'm thinking about the personality first always, because that is going to define, um, everything else basically. And so I think that, um, uh, yeah, these personalities, uh, of the hosts and the symbiotes together, um, each one is unique and different, and some are very healthy and some are very beautiful, like Venom, <laughs> um, and some are significantly less than. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, like uh, I would imagine Carnage, because they're bonded on a blood level, there's probably not a lot of walls between their, their information, but right. then you got someone like Lee Price, who is not a fan favorite, but what I liked about his introduction was that he was he bullied the symbiote like you were just talking about earlier. And uh, so when he bonded, the symbiote had no control over him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, because he had all these like government placed, you know, operation chips mm -hmm. in his brain. And mm -hmm. so he, he was able to control the symbiote. I'm like, Oh, so that's, it's cool. It's just cool to hear you say that. And I always like getting people's opinions on that because it's one of those things that writers, I'm like, uh, like, you know, you have that writing trope sometimes where, where you, it's like, oh, someone's purposely not telling another character something. And if they would just tell them, we could advance the story. Right. And and I'm like, well, with Venom, that would be really cool to just be like, you know, if Eddie has to interrogate somebody, the symbiote just wraps around their head and <laughs> takes their information. And then Eddie's like, oh, okay, yeah, I didn't need you to talk. I, I Now I know where to go and get the bad guy. Um, so yeah. it's like, I, I always wondered why it's not used like that, but maybe it doesn't work that way. So I was just curious your opinion. Yeah, um, I, I, I suspect that most symbiotes, basically when they form a bond, like it's almost right. like, it's like it's like we are paired now. You know, we are like you, you 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 they don't they don't just extract from they don't bond with many people. When they find their host, they find their host, you know. And someone like go. like the Carnage symbiote for instance started from Venom, right? right. Perfectly healthy sample, right. completely corrupted by the psyche of Cletus, you know, and and so Cletus just like completely you know, and I think Cletus like Cletus Cassidy's like joy. Yeah. horrid joy in bloodshed um really kind of struck you know the el the part of the the his symbiote right in the feels right like right in like the emotional center and you know i think i think um maybe it's it, it was a um a, a side effect of basically being an offshoot of venom you know but when it found cletus cassidy it was small it was weak and it really fed off of like that kind of like a uh, uh, sick, like joie de vivre, you know, kind of like, <laughs> and, and completely demented it, you know? So it's almost, sure. uh, you know, at that point, um, you know, you, that, that's an example of basically it really like his psyche really fed and almost not quite overwhelmed, but like really like um, nurtured. nurtured it. Yeah. Nurtured. nurtured it, it. I was say, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, and at this point they're just like, they're basically just the same. The same. Right. That's so cool, man. Well, <laughs> Uh, you know, Jonah, I, I can't, first of all, again, thank you for everything. Thanks for taking your time out of your, your very busy schedule. I know you're working on a lot of stuff. So cool. um, I want to just remind everyone, if you want more Jonah, please go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Please become a patron member for him. Uh, support his artwork, you know, support artists in general, if you can. Um, you know, the, the stuff he makes is amazing. And I will definitely do a, like a breakdown on, on some level a review of the anatomy book but I want people to go buy it first. So maybe like in a month or two, I'll come back on this channel and do like a proper review and, and plug you again and, and make sure people know about this interview and everything you make on your channel. And uh, you. is there any, any last things you want to say before we head out for the day? No, I think we covered it. I think yeah, I, we, we sure did. Super fun. I that love was that. a power half hour right there. <laughs> I love, I love symbiotes. I love symbiotes. One of my favorite spreads in the book was something they, they did not ask for at all. Oh. 
Um, but I, I wanted to, I wanted to show the, some of the other symbiotes in, uh -huh. um, just in containers in little jars. Yes. Um, so I'll yeah, I saw that you had like maybe scream in there and, uh, yeah. yeah, there you go. For you scream fans, for you, you know, well, carnage, maybe. Yep. There's, uh, there's la there's la lasher. Lasher. Yep. That's and, lasher. And, riot. And, um, phage and, phage. and riot at the end there. Yeah, and so there you go. I, I wanted to get, even though it was just their samples, I wanted to get their personalities and their hallmarks amazing. kind of like in there. That's um, amazing. there's also a, a spread for anybody who's interested in basically just showing there, well, there's the carnage symbiote reacting yep. to various stimuli. And then you get to see a close up of what's going on on like a much smaller level. You know, when, when a, a symbiote um, uh, um, pretends to be clothes, you know, right. like if, if you took a magnifying glass, you would see like little imperfections here and there, et cetera. But anyway, I just wanted to share, share that off because this is the Venom vlog. So As absolutely, man. I appreciate you doing that. So even more reason for all of you guys to go out there support Jonah's work, pick up Marvel Anatomy right now. Uh, you could buy it on Comixology or digital. You could buy it physical. I prefer you buy the physical one because it's an awesome coffee table book. It'll be a great part of your collection on your bookshelf. And uh, and then go please support this uh, this man's work. Please, please, please. I can't say it enough. He's um, he's amazing. And Thank and he you. and to take any of your time uh, twice, you know, like now um, to 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 let me have a second chance to do this and to be so understanding is is the nicest thing in the world. And I can't thank you enough for that, sir. You're absolutely welcome. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the interview. And thanks for everybody who's listening as well. Awesome. And uh, thank you guys so much for watching the show as always. Uh, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll have more episodes very soon. See you in the future. Peace.